the word of God for us, the people of God. Right. Thanks be to God. Moses was raised as royalty in one of the most impressive kingdoms that has ever existed. At the point at which Moses shows up, it has been a thousand years since Egypt built, built its first uh, pyramid. Right? At that point, Egypt is five times older than, than America is, and they're still getting warmed up. And, and so Moses shows up, and he is raised in the family of the queen who brought him in. And so they, he, he is taught how to read and write. And, and that's, that's an amazing thing to say, because if you think about how many people can one farmer feed today? A lot, right? Back then, 80% of people were farmers because if you didn't, you could feed your your family and just a little bit more because it was just that much hard. You had to do everything by hand, and, and so 80% of people were farmers. And so Moses is part of this elite group of folk who are trained to read and to write. He is trained to to lead people. He's trained to organize. He is a prince of Egypt. He is prepared to lead people in a way that is phenomenal. And, and then he does something crazy. He kills a guard. And we have all seen Charlton Heston's The Ten Commandments, so we all know how that tells the story, that he is then brought before his, his, uh, the guy who wants him out, and they, they, he, he is sort of disbarred and, and sent out. We don't actually know of how that unfolded. The Bible just says he kills a guard, then he flees. We don't know if it's shame. We don't know if it's fear. The long and short of it is he runs. And he goes out into the wilderness, and he doesn't die. If you think about what would it take for if I handed you a pocket knife and pointed you towards the woods and said, good luck, how many of us would, would live? It, this is a challenging thing. He, he goes into the wilderness, and he lives. He goes out. He is adopted into a tribe. He proves his worth, and he's entrusted with this great treasure. He's entrusted with Zipporah, this woman, who becomes his wife, and they have children. And he spends 40 years as a shepherd, defending his flock in the cold of the night and the heat of the day. This dude, he learns. 40 years. There are things that you don't learn about yourself and your profession until you've been at it not one year, not 10 years, but 30, 40 years. This man is a man of the land. He is prepared to be in the wilderness and to thrive. There are few people in all of history who are as prepared to do what Moses is called to do as Moses was. He was trained to lead men, and then he was prepared by 40 years of experience in the wilderness. And so when he is called by God to go and face down the most powerful man on earth, if one of, maybe top three, right, to go face down Pharaoh, let my people go, he, he, he can go do it. Now he's a nervous wreck, he's reluctant. If God calls you to do something and you're not a bit nervous about it, it might not be God. That, uh, but he is a nervous wreck about this, but he goes. He receives help, Aaron helps him, and he confronts Pharaoh, and he, he tells Pharaoh, let my people go, and, and eventually they go. They go through the waters, they go into the wilderness, and where we pick up the story, are, they are on their way to Mount Sinai. They're, they're trying to get to Mount Sinai. Now, as I said, no one in the Old Testament is as well-trained and prepared, and at this point, as accomplished as Moses is. The central event of the Old Testament is the Exodus, and Moses is the man at the center of it. You know those commercials about the most interesting man in the world? Stay thirsty, my friend. If you shot that commercial back then, Moses would be the man in the commercial. He is the most interesting person, right? If you just think about his life at this point, this guy is fascinating. And so Moses is leading the people into the wilderness, and Moses' father-in-law shows up, Jethro. And uh, I, I've watched a little, uh, what is it, NCIS? So I imagine Jethro as looking like Jethro on TV. <laughs> so Jethro shows up. And... He shows up, and it's important to read the first part of the chapter to get the sense of their relationship. Moses is the most important person in the room, and he bows before Jethro. He doesn't have to, right? He bows in, in, in before Jethro, and he takes the day off. Now, Moses is a busy man. Like, I, I'm a little bit busy right now. I don't have an entire people following me. I'm, I'm just trying to finish unpacking and, and do some other things. Like, if, the list of people I would take the whole day off if they showed up is kind of small. But I love you, I'll give any one of you lunch, 
but to give you the whole day, whew, right? That, that's that's a big ask. And then not only does he take the whole day off for his father-in-law, he calls all the heads of the tribes and says, "You're going to have what? You're going to come have dinner with them." I mean, for someone to show up and then for me to call the board, "Hey, uh, Laura, could you get a board meeting together tonight? There's someone I want you all have dinner with." Yes, drop everything and the bo everyone show up and have dinner. Like that's amazing. Uh, Moses and Jethro, they're tight. Right? They get along. They like each other. And, and so they, they catch up. They have this good day. Moses takes the day off to chill with, with Jethro. And then the next day, Moses gets up, gets dressed, goes off to work, and he starts doing his thing. And, and Jethro gets up, enjoys his cup of coffee, and then goes off to, to see how this goes. And he goes up and he sees Moses doing his thing, judging amongst all the people. And there's this long line, and people are showing up and explaining their cases, their situations. And Moses is saying, hmm, this, or he might do this. And so he's, he's advising them. And then Jethro asks a question. What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge and all the people stand about you from morning till evening? The tone of voice matters. The to tone of voice is essential. And the tone of voice is not something that you get out of the Bible. If you look at a page out of the Bible, how much of the Bible is black? by the type. It's like, what, 10-15% of the page? The rest of the page, the white spaces, that's like 80% of it. But that 80%, how you read the 80% matters. It, 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 one way to think about how you fill in the white spaces is, how would you make the movie of this? Like, if you were filming the shot where Jethro asks Moses, hey, why are you doing this? What's the tone of voice? That's why I think it's important to read the relationship ahead of time, because you could read this as Jethro looking at Moses and saying, Deuter, why are you doing this? This is crazy. This is stupid. I mean, he could, you could read it as Jethro doing a little bit of chewing, like, you, you are obviously a moron. What are you doing here? But, but you've read the relationship ahead of time, right? And so now you know that they, they like each other. And so this is not Jethro doing, doing a little bit of chewing. This is Jethro being genuinely confused. Like, man. You're working really hard at this. Well, what's the deal here? Like there, there's a genuine love there that he wants to understand. And so Moses says to his father-in-law, well, this is how it works. Pops, and they come to me, they come with a question, I tell them how it's gonna work, and then, uh, yeah, that's what we're doing. And, and so Jethro then responds, this is not gonna work for the long run, boy. This, this ain't gonna work. Like, eventually you're gonna burn out. He's concerned, right? he's concerned. Listen to me, I've got an idea. You know, God be with you either way. Here, here's my idea. You handle the hard stuff. You handle pointing, going to God, listening and understanding what God has to say. But then you go out and you find people who are trustworthy and honest and you, you find the people to lead the thousands and the hundreds and the fifties and the tens. Right? You, it's time to delegate. You let them handle the small stuff and you handle the big things. Right, you're going to the promised land. You focused on pointing to the promised land and you, you delegate all the small stuff. And Moses listens to his father-in-law and did what his father-in-law suggested, which is the mark of a great leader, someone who can take good advice and then does it, who cares more about it being done right than about his or her own pride. And so Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them the heads of the people, the leaders of the thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. And so Moses starts delegating all the way down to individual families. And then it tells, the scripture tells us, then they get going again, which is not a surprise. If Moses has to solve every problem that comes up among an entire people, you're not going to get a lot of velocity. You're not going to get to go in really fast. But he starts delegating, and you don't have to stop every time someone has a little bit of an argument. You, you've delegated the small problems, and Moses can stay focused on Mount Sinai is that way. What Jethro helps Moses to see is that he is absolutely essential. Having a leader who can point the direction to which you're going, that is absolutely essential. Someone to say, that way is Jesus. That's where we need to be focused. That is absolutely essential. It's necessary. But just having one good leader is not sufficient to the challenges of leading a people. Moses has to be pointing, but he needs to... Uh, train people and equip them. Because if Moses can't do it, the most trained and accomplished leader I can think of, 
I don't know anyone who can do it, who can do everything. He needs help. One way to think about this is it's like it's a bandwidth problem. One person can keep track of about seven situations. Think about what you're keeping track of right now, right? Kids going back to school, got to deal with the bills, got to, uh, you start doing, making a list of things you've you got on your mind. Is it more than seven? Right? What happens when you have, have more than seven things to take care of? This just kind of goes, shoof, right? A good leader is recruiting everyone to take care of this. And especially, I mean, if the problems are uh, lots of problems, right? You, you need help. You need bandwidth, right? So the leader of any one church, usually called the pastor, uh, does well to learn the lesson that Jethro taught Moses, which is probably something Moses had been taught in his youth and probably something Moses had forgotten. It's a lesson that I've had to learn multiple times. Don't you get tired of learning the same hard lesson time and again? Anyone do that? Yeah, yeah maybe you're better people than I. I learned the same hard lessons multiple times. I'd like to grow up and get it figured out one day. But this is... Uh, this is the lesson Jethro teaches. Don't do everything. The leader of a church, especially in the Methodist tradition, but the leader of the church has two uh, authorities, two powers, two goals. Here it is. First point, right? Run worship that points towards Jesus. That's where Jesus is. Everyone look that way, because that's where we need to go. Don't literally look that way. It would have been great if you did, though. I just... <laughs> But everyone look that way. That's my job, to run a worship service where you show up on a Sunday morning and it is a clear sign. This is where we need to go. Right? That's my first job. That's my first task. Here's my second task, is to line up your passions with what this church needs. Right, to line up what you care about deeply with what the church needs to do. And if I do those two things well, we're going to be doing well. Right? In the terminology of the passage, right, I'm Moses pointing towards Mount Sinai, and then I help each of you figure out what are you over, the leader, leader of the thousands and the hundreds and the tens and the fifties. If I do those two things well, I think we'll be in good shape. And you might say to yourself, but pastor, I don't believe I'm called by God to do anything. Like, you're called to preach, that's good but I don't know if I'm called to do anything. I disagree. You are indeed called. And the way that we most often find our calling is through being clear about what you're passionate about. What are you passionate about? What do you care about? What makes you smile? What makes you happy? What brings you joy? Right, to, to ask as specifically as possible, what do you suffer for? But passion, the word passion comes from the Latin verb passus, to suffer. Right? What you have a passion for is what you're willing to suffer for. I'm willing to suffer for my preaching. Well, on Thursday afternoon, we uh, had a meeting here, and, and then afterwards I went and I spent family time. We went out to the pool, great pool, went out to the pool and hung out at the pool for a while with the kids, and my in-laws showed up. We went and had dinner up at Grill 109, had a great steak, and came back, chilled for a little bit, put the kids to bed, had, had good family time for the day, and then you know what I did? Did I sit back and relax? No, I came here, and at 10.43, I typed the words I'm speaking right now in that office, because I have a passion for preaching. I want to present you the best sermon I can, because if you're going to show up on a Sunday morning and get up early and get out of bed and come here, you better have a really good reason to get here. I better be offering you something of excellence. Right? That's my task. That's my passion. That's my gig. You have your own passions that you offer to the church. Have you and will you offer your passions to the work of the church? Now, you might be wondering, but pastor, my passion and my skill does not seem all that important. Like, you're called to preach, and that's impressive. It's really not, but whatever. Right? You're called to preach, but my passion, my skill, I'm not sure it matters. Let's talk about getting a car going down the road. What does it take to keep a car going down the road? You gotta have some tires. What else do you gotta have working on a car to get it down the road? Gas, gas tank. What else? Driver, yes. What else? I've got a mic. You don't, you gotta speak up. Transmission, steering wheel, doors. Right? Think of all the parts that go into keeping a car going down the road. 
Now, if the transmission, let's talk about the transmission for a moment. The transmission, I hear people talk about dropping a new engine in, but I almost never hear people working on a transmission because once your transmission is shot, what are you looking for? A new car, all right? Transmission is one of the most essential parts of the vehicle. You know what a transmission is useless without? What is the most simple part of the car? The absolute most simple part of the car. It's that little lever, lever of plastic that you grab and you move it from P to D. If you don't have the $5 gear shift, you know how much use that transmission is? Zilch, right? It doesn't matter how good your transmission is. If you can't get it out of park, you're not going anywhere. Every part of the car is essential. And it, move, if we move that analogy over to the church, maybe the pastor is the steering wheel. And maybe one person is the chair of the board and organizes all the meeting. And another person is a treasurer and does all the work with the numbers. And maybe your passion is not for organizing. Maybe your passion is not for working with numbers. Maybe your passion is for baking. You know what we can't have a fellowship meal without? food, right? We can't have communion unless someone bakes some bread, and as you'll know, grow to know over time, you never want to trust me to bake anything. I can cook anything. I can't. I tried to make cookies once. I ended up with granola. It was bad, right? Your passion for baking is essential for making this church work. Some people are the leaders of thousands. Some people are the leaders of the tens, but we are all essential. I believe that each one of you has God-given gifts and passions and talents. You are essential to this church. If I, if I had the time, I would look at each of you, make eye contact, and say, you are, and you, and you, and you, you are each essential to this church. And I am profoundly convicted that we have everything we need in the room right here to thrive as a church. We have all the gifts and passions and talents that we need to do what God desires of us, to thrive and to grow in our faith, to grow as a church, to grow as disciples. We have everything we need here as each of us offers our passions, our talents, our skills. Each one of us is absolutely essential to keeping the car going down the road, and each of us is essential for helping this church to grow and thrive and be the place where we experience the presence of Jesus Christ. Over the coming weeks, we're going to start having coffee together. I actually got that organized this week. We're going to start this Wednesday at 2 at Dorothy's. And there's a sign up and back if you want to come, come have coffee for that. And there's a sign up to say if you want to get people together at your house to have coffee. Seven to eight people get together at your house and have coffee. And one of the questions I'm going to ask when we get all the coffee poured is, what is your passion? What do you care about? What drives you? Right? I want to know that about each of you. And if it makes you a little bit nervous to answer that question? Well, it made Moses nervous too. But Moses had Aaron to lean on, to walk with. And we're going to walk through this together. We're going to go places, folks. We're going to get down the road and we're going to go places in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm just excited to think about where we're going to go. I don't have a clue what it's going to look like yet. But as we offer our passions and our talents and our skills together, it's going to be good. Thanks be to God. Amen.